Well, good morning, Eastview Christian Church family. I hope you all had a wonderful Easter. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Zach Thompson. I'm the high school pastor here at Eastview, and I hope you guys had a great uh, weekend last... Are you cheering for me or... Oh, guys, it's not about me. Okay, here we go. Uh, Gosh, I gotta get back to the intro. Okay. (laughs) Oh, you spoiled me. So... I, I hope, really, sincerely though, I hope you guys had a great weekend last week celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, I hope that you found healing and redemption that comes with the fact that our Savior is alive and that he brings redemption and he brings healing and that there is hope in all of that for all of us. And I also believe that there is hope that I think we're moving into spring now. Because <laughs> I think we've passed that one weird week in April that goes back to winter. Okay, so I'm hoping that we're there now. Now, sometimes we jump straight to summer uh, here in Illinois, but I'm hoping we get a little bit of spring weather. If you're new here or you are watching online, I just wanna welcome you guys, especially if you're here maybe back for the second time after Easter. And if you're here today and you're thinking that everyone here has got this all figured out, that we know exactly how to follow Jesus, we've got our whole life together, well, that's just not it. Really, we're just a bunch of broken people in need of grace, and we're captivated by this guy that rose from the dead. We're captivated by this guy. We want to know about him. We want to know more about who he is. And so for the last nine weeks, we journeyed through the weekend that changed the world, right? The weekend that changed everything because Jesus died to our sin, and he rose again from the grave and defeated death forever. Today, we're going to jump back into Jesus's ministry as we start our new series we're calling Leading Questions. Now, throughout Jesus' time on earth, he spent a lot of time teaching. I think we could say that the main purpose of Jesus, though, was eventually to go to the cross and rescue us from our sins. But along the way, he had a lot of lessons to teach about what it really means to follow God. And one of the things that he did the most was he asked really, really good questions. And these questions were so good They were so good that they would lead his disciples to become better followers of him. And not only that, but they would lead his disciples to better understand, okay, what is this kingdom of God that's a mystery to us? So we thought, let's look at the questions Jesus asks his disciples, and let's answer along with them. And then maybe as a church, we can better become followers of Jesus and understand how the kingdom of God works. So if you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, we're going to be in verse 14 to start. And as you guys are flipping there, I have a question for you as we set the context for this passage. You guys ever deal with difficult people? I'm, I'm sure you don't. I'm sure everyone always understands what you're trying to say. I'm sure everyone always agrees with what you're saying. I'm sure no one ever talks to you in a rude or sarcastic tone, right? We deal with sarcastic people. I was thinking about the the rude and sarcastic tone, and uh, I don't know why this memory pops up, but last summer our family was vacationing up to Minnesota, and I did the thing you don't do when you have contact lenses, as I forgot my contacts. And... So I spent a whole evening freaking out and calling all of these eye doctors, asking if they had contacts that I could borrow, all right? Believe it or not, (laughs) people are not that forgiving (laughs) for someone that's forgotten your contacts. And I remember this one lady, she was just giving me such a hard time. She was asking all of these questions. She's like, well, we're going to need this, this, and this. I don't know if we can do this. And I'm like, can you just work with me a little bit? And by the end, of the end of the call, she's like, we can't do anything for you, sorry. And she's like, but I have one more thing to ask you. Seriously? Who forgets their contacts? Like, who does that? I'm like, sorry, Barb, I guess I make a mistake. Right? We deal with rude people. We deal with difficult people. Did you know that Jesus dealt with difficult people? He did. The context of our passage today happens right after Jesus has run, had a run-in with these guys called the Pharisees. You've probably heard of the Pharisees before. Maybe you haven't, but the Pharisees, they were experts in the religious law, and sometimes I think we give the Pharisees a hard time. These guys were a bunch of jerks. 
they were terrible people, but when you think about it, they knew their Bible really well. They followed the law to a T. To a T. They probably had a lot of their Bible memorized. Okay, these guys were like church leaders. But the thing was, they didn't really love Jesus because he challenged their traditions. They had all of these laws and traditions that they followed, and Jesus constantly challenged them. In this instance today, the Pharisees are upset that the disciples were not following one of their ancient traditions. And one of the, this tradition was the disciples didn't wash their hands before dinner. Which, by the way, I, maybe I would have been a little upset too. Okay, I don't want a disciple breaking off bread for me. Okay, wash your hands. That's gross, right? But they were angry because the Pharisees and the Jews, you don't eat without the proper hand-washing technique. You've got to go through the proper hand-washing technique because if you don't, then you would be determined as unclean. They would say, you're unclean, you're defiled. And so the Pharisees, they get upset and they say some things to Jesus and then Jesus gets upset. He gets upset with these guys and this question because these guys are so concerned about a tradition that they neglect the judgment and the junk that's going on in their hearts. And that's what leads Jesus then to take an opportunity to teach and to ask a question. One that has to do with focusing on what's on the inside, not on what's on the outside. So Mark chapter seven, starting in verse 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, hear me all of you and understand There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean." And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Let me pray. God, I know you're here In this space, I know you're with every person watching online or every person that's gonna be listening to this later. And so God, I pray today you would preach your word to your people, that the name of Jesus would be glorified and proclaimed. God, that the good news, that we are made clean by the power of the blood of Jesus. May today change us that we don't leave the same as when we walked in. And God, I pray all these things in Jesus' powerful name, amen. So Jesus, in saying these things here in this short little paragraph, he does something pretty big here, maybe not to you and I right now, but for the Jews listening in, for the religious leaders listening in, for even the disciples who are listening into this conversation, this is big news to them of what Jesus is saying here. The question that Jesus asks is hugely impactful for how they've been following God up until this point. And what's gonna change now for how they're gonna follow him in the future? And it's extremely important to our understanding even to look at how we follow Jesus when we understand this passage. So in order to understand what Jesus is getting at here, I think it's important to know the previous understanding of what it meant to follow God that Jesus is breaking down in this passage. All right, so verse 15. This is the big sentence that Jesus says here, and he says it a couple of times. Verse 15, he says, there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. He says it later in verse 18. Don't you see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? And then there's this phrase in parentheses in my Bible that stands out after Jesus says this. I don't know if you see it. But it says, thus he declared all foods clean. Jesus, as he asks this leading question to the disciples, is referencing, like this tradition that the Pharisees were upset about, about washing hands, he's referencing a ceremonial law about clean and unclean foods, right? And so 
back in Exodus, if you were to think about this for just a second, back in Exodus, when Moses freed God's people from slavery in Egypt, God set about laws for them to live as a free people that would set them apart from the rest of the world. Now you have to think about this. These people have been living for 400 years in a place with intense idolatry and sin. It was all around them. They had no real concept of what a holy God is because they were surrounded by idolatry and sin. And so God's like, now that you're free, now that you're under my authority, you need to be set apart. You need to live differently. And so he made these laws so that these people would be presented holy and set apart. And one of those laws was food. God made it so that there were certain animals that he declared clean and unclean as a way to be holy. Because God said, I am holy. And if you're gonna be around me, if you're gonna be my people, you need to be holy too. Not only that, but it would set them apart from the idolatrous cultures. They eat all this food, but you're not gonna eat that. And it would also mean that for an animal to be declared unclean, if they were to eat that animal, it would defile them, all right? And so it seems a little ridiculous at first. If you were to go back, you can look in Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14, how specific God gets with these animals. It's crazy, but he was very specific. This is what you eat. This is what you don't eat. This is what's clean. This is what's unclean. So I thought in order to really encapsulate this idea, I thought it might be fun to have a little fun in here. Okay, down the hall in the student area, we love to play games. And I thought we'd play a game today with all of you. Does that sound good? I, I hope you guys wanna have a little fun today. All right, this game is what I'm calling clean versus unclean. Okay, and here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you a picture of an animal. All right, we're gonna see how well you know your ancient Levitical laws. Okay, now this requires participation. For you online, you guys can shout it out and I probably won't hear you, but who knows? <laughs> okay, if you yell loud enough, maybe. Um, so I'm gonna show an animal and you're gonna shout out to me whether you think it's clean or whether you thought God said that was unclean. Okay, this all comes from Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. So let's run through these quickly. I just wanted us to be honest for a second. <laughs> How's your bedroom? <laughs> All right. Is it clean or unclean, everybody? <laughs> All right, here, I, I assumed you guys, it's clean. Now, if I were to ask, how is your child's bedroom? Maybe this is a different answer here, <laughs> okay? I thought we'd just be honest for a second. All right, here we go. Okay, unclean. Good, unclean, you got it. How about the camel? <laughs> clean or unclean? Unclean, no eating camels, okay? How about the gazelle? Clean or unclean? I heard a lot of cleans, good. Clean. How about the eagle? Un I'm here. We're getting quieter, we're less confident. <laughs> unclean, I would also say patriotic too, probably unclean to eat a bald eagle here in the United States too, <laughs> okay? <laughs> How about the chameleon? Chameleon is unclean. Yes, the Bible does specifically say the chameleon is unclean to eat, okay? <laughs> How about the cricket? Unclean, oh, that's like one of the cleanest things you can eat. Mm. Come on. All right. How about the sheep? Clean, I hear a lot of cleans. Some of you are like, wait a minute. I forgot to tell you, this was a trick question. This sheep died of natural causes. It's unclean. Okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway. That was fun. But the purpose is actually quite important to this. God wanted his people to be holy compared to the rest of the world. One, because God is holy. Two, because that was one of their greatest witnesses. Um, it, for, for example, with that, it, I would encourage you guys, I don't have time to do this, but go look up the first chapter of Daniel. That is an example of a witness 
by not eating the foods that defile that God declares unclean. So it's not inconceivable that the Pharisees and religious leaders were still following laws like what to eat, what not to eat, hand washing, all of that. It's not inconceivable that they would still be doing this. So what's the problem? The problem is the people were missing the heart of God. To them, the law was the most important thing. If I follow these things, that's the most important thing. But what was the heart behind the law? The heart behind the law was presenting the heart as clean. Not the outside, presenting the inside as clean. To clean the blemishes of the real defilement going on, the sin. That's what the heart of the law was. So why was God, or why was Jesus declaring all foods clean? Because Jesus was saying, I'm here to cleanse all sin. This outdated tradition, it was, it was that. It was outdated because Jesus has come to fulfill the purpose. Eating certain foods, that was a temporary solution to the sin problem. They had to continue to repeat this over and over, to not be defiled. Jesus, he's the eternal solution to this. Jesus is here, you don't have to worry about this anymore. Don't believe me? I have a couple of verses for us. Colossians 2, 16 through 17, therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Galatians 3, 23 through 26 says, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. We actually see this play out in Acts with Peter. He has this vision of these foods and animals coming down from heaven. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, don't call common. You may ask, why don't we offer sacrifices anymore? Or why do we not eat certain foods anymore? Or why don't we follow Levitical laws anymore? Because they all pointed to the fulfillment of the atoning blood of Jesus. It all points to Jesus, which is really great news if you think about it. Jesus has made us clean by the power of his blood. I don't have to worry whether or not I'm eating bacon. We can still enjoy bacon and be clean. That's good news. That's good news. But this is why Jesus can say there's nothing outside a person that can defile him. You are now presented holy. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, but the things that come out of a person are what defile you because you can still dirty up the inside. I may present you holy on the outside, but there's some mess going on that you need to clean up on the inside. Listen, this is a punch gut. (laughs) It's a punch in the gut to the Pharisees. Their whole life has been committed to the law, to the actions, to the external motives and ways of serving God. And all the while, that's not what God wants most. God wants what's going on on the inside. This is, this is hard for the Pharisees to process it because Jesus has another run in with the Pharisees and he says this to them. He says, and the Lord said to them, now you Pharisees, you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within and behold, everything is clean for you. He's he's saying the outside looks really good, guys, but the inside is a mess. It's a mess of what's going on. He keeps going. He says to them, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb but you neglect the justice and the love of God. Those you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. That last phrase is a harsh thing he says to them because according to the law that they've been following, if you come in contact with a grave, that makes you unclean. So what Jesus is saying here, these people are coming up to you and you're making them unclean without them knowing it because you're giving them the wrong message. 
you're leading them astray. I added this last part in here because, guys, the Bible's funny. And, and Jesus, he just, he's awesome. It says, after he says this, one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And Jesus said, well, then woe to you lawyers also. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You give people the burden of following all these rules, yet you have no compassion on them when they're really struggling with them. Jesus, he's letting no one off the hook here because following Jesus starts from within. It starts from within, not with an external checklist of what to do. Yet how often do we treat the Jesus following life as primarily these are the rules you have to follow? And and even more than that, how often do we lay that burden on others saying, you want Jesus to love you, you've got to do this, this, and this. Church, we're hurting our witness if we're telling people you have to be a certain person. You have to do these certain things to experience the love of Jesus. That's way too much of a burden. And that's not what Jesus is getting at here. What Jesus is getting at is that following him is not all about the foods that you eat or if you wash with the ceremonial technique, but it's what's coming out of the inside that matters. And so it's a simple question Jesus asks his disciples. Verse 18, do you not see? Don't you see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Y'all, don't tell me the Bible is not funny, (laughs) okay? Because you see what Jesus is saying here at the last part? It enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Other versions, instead of saying expelled, say emptied into the latrine, going into the sewer. Jesus is saying, whatever comes into you, it's just going into the toilet. He's he's very specific here, but very literal and very right. These foods, it doesn't defile you. It's just going into the toilet, in and out, right? And I feel like it doesn't do Jesus's question justice without understanding the context he's talking about here. If they were to hear this is being expelled, right? The people would have pictured like an ancient Roman latrine, which is this is what it would have looked like. And um, talk about up close and personal, uh, for, for you guys in here that know the rule, I think this is where the every other rule was invented. <laughs> if you don't know what that is, ask a guy you know, because I hope the guys know. <laughs> Here's the thing. If following Jesus is, is all about what I can or I can't do or how I can make myself look really good on the outside, and it's not about the transformation that's going on in the heart, might as well just go pop a squat on the toilet, right? Because here is where Jesus is leading his disciples with this question. Following me is internal. It's not external. Following Jesus is internal, not external. It's more about the heart than it is about the action. Okay, what Jesus, I think he's getting at here is there's a way to do God's stuff without understanding the heart. There's a way to serve in the food pantry without having a heart for the poor. There's a way to read your Bible every day without really pursuing a relationship with the author. There's a way to pray all the time and never really be vulnerable and honest with the mess that's going on in your heart. Right? Can I, I wanna be honest with all of you about something too, and this might be a a scary truth. I think that following the food laws may be a lot easier than what Jesus is saying here. I think what the Pharisees were doing might've been a lot easier. It's easier, I think, to follow a bunch of rules, to check off things on the list than to give your heart completely to God, everything to him. Think about it this way. A lot of us in the room who are married, I'm five months in, so I'm still learning. (laughs) But I think a lot of us would say it'd be a lot easier if our spouse just gave us a list of rules and a list of things to do that that would make them feel loved, (laughs) right? That they said, okay, if you clean the dishes, I'll feel loved. If you pick up the kids, I'll feel loved. If you choose me over work, I'll feel loved. If you pause the TV, turn and look at me when I'm talking to you, 
I'll feel loved, right? It's much harder just to wake up and, and love your wife like Christ loved the church with no rules or checklists. And by the way, I'm speaking to myself here because I can be really lousy at this. I really want a checklist sometimes. <laughs> Jesus doesn't focus on the rule here. He wants the relationship. Jesus says, just, just love me. And then what comes from within will show me your love, will show me. But that kind of relationship, that relationship takes work, work on a deep, deeper level, level than just eating certain foods. It's why in a weird way, I think we're drawn to religion. We're drawn to religion. Our nature wants to create structures to follow. What are the things I need to do to be a Christian? Okay, got it. What are the things I can't do? Okay, got it. So that I can check things off the list and say, I accomplished this following Jesus thing. I'm doing this. But you soon realize that kind of faith, it's empty. Which is why I think a lot of people walk away or are turned off by this kind of Christianity because they hear something they don't like or they hear something they don't wanna do and they're out. But that's not what this is about. Jesus isn't about the shallow religiosity. What goes into a person is not what defiles him. What comes out, what comes from the heart, that's what defiles you. As we were studying this week, Mike made sure that we knew the Greek word for defile. You guys know Mike loves his Greek words. And I assumed the word defile, it meant like to make this gross, to make it yucky, to defile something. But actually, the Greek word for defile is a word called koinao, which means to make common. To make common, which makes sense. It's the opposite of being set apart. It means to be like everything else, tainted with sin. So let me rephrase, rephrase the question by saying this. Jesus asking, do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot make him common? What comes out of a person's heart is what makes him common. This simple question he asks his disciples, he's like, do you not see? You guys are set apart. You're not defiled. You have a witness unlike any other. You're not like everyone else. When your heart is transformed before God, not whether or not you eat that piece of bacon, you're different, you're set apart, you're not common when your heart is transformed with a love for God. There's a transformational answer to this question. You and I are answering along with these disciples here this morning, that following Jesus means my heart is being changed first, then my actions. Change the inside, then the outside will change, not the other way around. So we have to ask, what are the things that defile my heart that make me common? Just like there was a list in the Old Testament of foods you could not eat, we have a new list. It says, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things come from within and they defile a person. I would assume I've caught everyone here or listening online with something on this list. And you know what I would start with first? I'd start with this list and getting these things under control. Then we'll talk about the things we do on the outside. And, and now it's a little bit of a catch-22 because it's hard, again, not to take this list and say, okay, here's what I can't do, <laughs> right? So we need to switch the thinking. The Bible says these things come from within, meaning that there's a heart change that needs to happen first. There's a transformation that needs to happen in the heart. You can't just say, okay, I'm gonna stop thinking evil thoughts without first changing and healing your heart. That's like saying, I'm gonna start eating healthy. Meanwhile, your fridge is still full of soda and ice cream and cookie dough. Here's the thing, Jesus wants your heart first, above all else, and not just part of your heart, he wants your whole heart. If anything today, please hear that. If you're in here today or you're watching online and, and you've been walking with Jesus for a really long time, today is a heart check for you. Today's a heart check, how's your heart? Has your walk with Jesus felt more like a religion or a relationship? 
Are you guarding your heart against the temptation to just go through the motions, check off the boxes? Or are you really growing in your love for God? If you've just started following Jesus or you're still really learning about what it means to follow him, you're growing in all of this, prioritize your heart above all else. Guard that thing like your life depended on it. Guard it because that is the most precious thing to God. What are the things that are coming out of you right now that are making you common? What's the heart work that you've got to prioritize right now? Which of these on this list are defiling your heart right now? Because here is the thing, your inner life has to come first. Your inner life has to come first. So I ask you, how is your time with the Lord? Is it sweet or mundane right now? How is your prayer intimacy? How is your word intake? How is your spiritual formation? All of those are heart work. And for those maybe that are in here today or or you're watching online and you're brand new, maybe you're new for the second time here after Easter and you're still not sure about this whole Jesus thing, I, I would think this is good news for you today because Jesus isn't all about the rules. Jesus just wants you to love him first. He just wants your heart first. And here's the thing, if someone has steered you away from Christianity because they've said, hey, you have to be baptized or you have to be straight or you have to be clean from your addiction or you have to understand the doctrine of limited atonement or you have to do this and this and this and then you can come in these doors and you can experience the love of Jesus. I'm sorry. Sometimes we get this wrong, right? Jesus wants the heart first. All the rest comes with the transformation that Jesus brings when you choose to love him. He's really good at that too. He's really good at that. Where's my proof? How can I say that Jesus first and foremost wants you to love him first, that that's the most important thing? Well, Jesus says it in Mark 12. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? It starts with prioritizing and protecting the heart because that's what God wants the most. And here's the thing, when we're so focused on what we're eating or if we're doing the proper hand-washing ritual or we're looking and judging the external actions of someone else, we avoid dealing with sin in the heart. Because here's the thing, I, I know my own tendency for pride and to hurt people because I wanna hide myself from others and present myself as better than I actually am. But when I do that, I'm actually neglecting the sin in my own heart. And here's the thing, Jesus is saying, hey Pharisees, it's great you guys wash your hands before dinner, but there's some serious pride going on in your heart. You've gotta fix that first. Hey Eastview kids leader, it's great that you are teaching our kids about God, but you're gossiping about that leader across the hall. You've gotta fix that first. Hey, Eastview giver, it's great that you're tithing and you're giving money to the church, but you just lied on your tax return. You've got to fix that first. Hey, Eastview member, see this list? Focus on this. This is the heart work that needs to happen. It's why Jesus asked this question to his disciples. Do you not see? Do you not see? It's what comes from your heart that is sinful. It's what comes from your heart that's hurting your witness. That's what's making you common. That's what's making you unclean. Last week, we celebrated Easter Sunday and we talked about the physical sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus. And because of that, we get to experience one day the physical reality of heaven. But perhaps what we truly need to understand is the grace and the sacrifice and the love of Jesus transforms and resurrects the heart. That you can live in that now, you don't have to wait until you die. And some of you in here have a lot of junk going on right here. 
The outside might look good, but there's a lot of mess going on in here. Let me just give you good news this morning. Jesus can clean it. He can clean that. In this question and answer, Jesus declared all foods clean. But here's the most incredible news I can give you today. For those who choose to believe and trust that Jesus died and rose from the grave through the cross and the resurrection, your heart is clean now. Will you give your heart to him first? Will you guard it? Let me speak Psalm 51 over you as we close. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Amen.